anniversary approaches, quite a thought that it's still such a living uh, issue uh, 70 years on. Um, and our focus, of course, will not really be um, about independence for India and Pakistan, although that is the same story in one sense. Our focus is going to be on uh, partition itself. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by asking each person on the panel to focus in on one particular area. And I'm hoping that we won't repeat ourselves and that we'll manage to just have uh, sort of five or six micro visions of uh, partition. Um, Shabni Basu, if I can ask you first to uh, briefly touch on what is often neglected in the story of partition. People tend very much to focus on Punjab, focus on North India. <laughs> what happened in Bengal is always a secondary part of the story. So w would, you, would you begin by talking about that? Sure. Uh, Patrick, it's uh, actually Bengal. The interesting thing is Bengal was partitioned twice. So in 1905, Curzon partitioned Bengal because this was the heart of revolution and all the, you know, the insurgency movements were coming from here. So they partitioned Bengal, which led to a lot of protests. It was the beginning then of the Swadeshi movement. You had authors writing, you know, Mande Matram was sort of sung out loud. So all these protests, till it reached a stage when in 1911 they had to actually um, you know, sort of reunite Bengal because there was so much protest. Uh, and they shifted the capital to Delhi from Calcutta. But what's interesting is that the next partition is then, you know, Bengal then votes for partition. And that is because by then the whole climate has changed. And Congress and the Hindu Mahasabha, they, they want the partition as well. Uh, do, you, do you want to just um, touch on who votes for partition? How many people actually want it? Well, yeah, I think it was the Congress and the Mahasabha. They were largely for partition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Hindus, rather, did want the partition. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened is by 1946, the violence has already begun in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, it's always a blame game on all parties. But it's the call for the direct action day. And then you have the great Calcutta killings because uh, there's a riot over there. And it's, it's the Hindus who then attack Muslims in Calcutta. You have as many as about 5,000 dead. And uh, then it spreads to Noah Khali in 1946, by, by then, which is in what is now uh, East, East, uh, East Bengal now. And uh, it, it now, takes... Now Bangladesh. Now Bangladesh, yeah. sorry, yeah. And it, uh, that's where it spreads. So earliest violence is actually happening in Bengal. And then it takes forward. The, the violence spreads all over and in Punjab. So it goes on from there. And uh, Mohini Noon, um, if I can ask you now, I remember uh, 20 years ago interviewing people in Punjab about their, their personal memories. And at that time, uh, it was almost as if it had been unmentioned for several decades. Now you have a situation where, in a way, the memory is being revived or collected, and yet the number of people who have personal knowledge or experience is, is, is almost nil. I mean, that, you know, that generation is disappearing. Can you say something about your family's personal uh, experience of what happened in 47, 48? Yeah, you see in the partition, if they say a million people died in 16, there was a migration of 16 million. These are statistics. But is the trauma of that one individual that was, you know, replicated a million times in those deaths and 16 million times. So the human cost of it was terrible. My family was affluent and, you know, they had properties in Lahore and Peshawar, but they were actually in Dhalausi in their summer homes and the partition happened. So they lost everything because they, all their assets were on the wrong side of the border, but they didn't suffer. But my, in my immediate extended family, my uh, sister who lives in New York, uh, Keku, her husband is a Sindhi, Dr. Harish Murjani. His father's family were in a tiny place called Kherpur in Sindh. And um, it was about five families. And in fact, the whole area was named, known after their name. So, you know, it was that small. Mm. Family of 11 children. And the eldest went off to Simla before 1947 to join the railways. And five siblings went with him because, you know, I mean, don't forget how different life was in 1946, 47. There were no phones. There were no computers. The postal service was totally disrupted. Mm. So someone who went to Simla with five siblings to set up home and, you know, for company, it was a concept we don't understand today, just disappeared. And uh, another brother went off to the army and when was sent to Europe to the war. So that left 
six of them behind parents and four children. So um, my sister's father-in-law, Kishan Murjani, was 14. Now, he actually became a boy scout. And this is relevant because that Englishman actually sell, say, helped save their lives. And um, j before, just before August, a Muslim named Mir came and took over all the properties. So in fact, changed the name of the mahalla. But he had a Sikh friend in Delhi who had told him, please don't kill anyone. Send them to me in Delhi, and I will take care of them. And somehow that penny dropped with Mir. And he told this particular family, I'll give you an escort of three Muslims, and he will take you to as far as, as they'll take you as far as they can. Mm. So now there were six of them, no money. So how do they buy tickets? The mother had a gold bangle. So Kishan Murjani, who was 14, went and pawned it for 555 rupees, which got them the tickets. So they took a night train from Kherpur to Hyderabad in Sindh, spent the night, and there was a special train in the morning that was for Hindus to take them to Delhi. Boarded that with this three-man Muslim escort who went with them to the last junction. Now, he can't remember the name of the junction. And don't forget the boundaries were actually declared two days after. So nobody really knew. That's when the mob got onto the train with guns, with knives, with machetes and started hacking people. Now, that Englishman who um, had taken Kishan to be a Boy Scout had actually got them a permit from his friend, the Deputy Commissioner of Hyderabad, to give them the right to leave. And it had an official seal on them. So these three Muslim escort went to the mob and said, look, don't touch them, and explained they had the seal. Now, there were no lights on the train. I don't know why. In torchlight, they actually looked at the document, and they looked at the seal, and that saved their lives. But Kishan, 14-year-old, saw a pregnant woman being knifed to death on the platform, women being raped, Sikhs and Muslims being hacked to pieces. He's now 84. He still has nightmares. And he's conveyed this anxiety to his children. So they reached Delhi safely. They found their way to that Sikh. They lived in a servant's quarter of his. Meanwhile, they didn't know what happened to the siblings, because there was, they didn't know whether they were dead or alive. And it's miraculous that. He was selling biscuits outside the central secretariat when he saw his eldest brother, who had left home with those other four children, walking down the road. <laughs> and much later, they discovered the, uh, so they were reunited. They discovered the brother who joined the army. He'd had a nervous breakdown, lost his mind, and he was in an asylum in Calcutta because he'd been in the European war. So they were all reunited. It ended happily, but not for a lot. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you for that, that personal story of, of survival. Um, a happier story than that of many, many people at this time. Um, Meghna Desai, I know that you are part of a major new initiative uh, through a museum in uh, Amritsar to really preserve and recover some of this heritage of partition. Uh, do you want to say a little about the museum and what, yeah. what lies behind it? Yeah. This is, uh, this is real, you really have to think of me as not me, but as my wife, uh, Kishore Desai, uh, who started a trust called the Arts and Cultural Heritage Trust and began this idea of having a museum for the partition uh, of, of India and Pakistan. Right now it is mainly about Punjab, uh, because both her parents come from Lahore. So she was very aware that lots of stories were being lost as her parents' friends were dying. So she started this idea of collecting the memories of people who had been through partition, sort of like what Moini was saying. And these, these memories are being recorded uh, are, and will, will be available uh, for anybody to hear. And then also people are offering artifacts some that they carried across the border, often the only artifact they carried across the border. Uh, for example, one family had just a simple gada uh, for water. They carried that across somebody, uh, you know, and each person, there's a lovely story of a, of a couple who were engaged on the other side of the border. Both were made, uh, made kind of homeless. They meet up in the food queue at a refugee camp. Uh, and then they realize that the, 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 something must be going on. So then their family gets married. So he, only thing he carried was a briefcase with him. Uh, and she carried a fulkari. So this was their presence to each other. 
and that Fulkari and the briefcase are exhibited in, in, this, in this museum. And there, one lovely story I heard the other day that there is a man who, who was given permission to sit in front of the British. It was a rare privilege. So he was given a certificate that you know, Sardar so and so is allowed to sit when there are Englishmen around. And that, that certificate is going to be exhibited because it was, it was that bad <laughs> that, that you, know, you could. And so with lots of these things are being carried and we're also collecting statistics and data on how people recovered and re rehabilitated themselves. Because there's a marvelous story, again, like Mohini was saying, that people who had nothing, who had come across, <coughs> survived, and then they made fortunes for themselves. And you know, so th those stories are also being told. So it is not only the story of the tragedy of the human beings. It's like a people's museum. But it is also a story of recovery and rehabilitation. So it ultimately ends up as a hopeful story. And the one wing of that museum has been opened last October, and the full museum will be open on 17th of August this year, 2017, and the 70th anniversary of the partition, because the border boundaries were published on the 17th of August. Because Mountbatten thought people should enjoy independence before finding out the real story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Faisal Devji, if I can ask you as a, a historian to talk about the way in which partition has tended to be uh, remembered. Um, often the, the history is done either around the sort of excitement of the narrative of, event, of events uh, or the, the kind of technicalities of why partition was wanted, should partition have happened, and so on. Uh, I mean, have you noticed uh, in, let's say, the last 10 years or so, the last 10 or 20 years, a kind of change in the historiography of partition, the way in which it is written about by historians? Yes, I, absolutely. I think mm. that, um, and this is not something originally I'm saying, mm. it's only from the 1980s uh, that partition studies becomes important uh, for scholars, and partition becomes a subject of, of, if you will, popular culture in a big way. And this is at least in part because of the insurgency in the Punjab. Uh, which reminded people that that mm. chapter, which, has, which was supposedly closed with partition in 1947, had not, in fact, been closed, mm. that it had consequences. Um, but more than this, when the work starts coming out in the 80s and 90s on partition, you also have happening in the West uh, a kind of slew of works on Holocaust history, genocide history, etc., which informs the Indian and Pakistani writing about partition. Mm. Now, this is all very interesting, but I think it also loses sight of something very crucial, that the Indian and Pakistani and indeed Bangladeshi languages of partition are not equivalent to and not expressed in the same way as the kind of Western, if you will, stories of genocide and Holocaust. What, what is the, the primary difference? Well, one thing uh, is that there, you know, it's very interesting that uh, Keshwar and uh, uh, Meghna Desai are the first people to think about memorializing partition. Absolutely. But in a way, they can do it. They do it in Punjab, which is precisely the place where the new discourse of partition studies emerges from. And I wonder if it's one reason why that is the case is because Punjab, on both sides of the border, has been relatively cleansed of all its minorities. So yeah. Punjab is the only place where, as it were, the Hindu-Muslim problem or the Hindu-Sikh problem, Hindu, uh, sorry, Muslim-Sikh problem, is no longer, as it were, available for popular um, uh, you know, being taken up by popular controversy. Right. And that's where the museum is possible. Whereas in the rest of India or Pakistan, it's very difficult to memorialize yeah. without actually pointing fingers at others who might happen to be minorities so and you, then creating the possibility of civic strife. Are you saying it can, can be conceived as the past and looked at as the past in a way that would not be possible in UP, for example? Yes, yes I think that's true because the, the likelihood of a memorialization becoming part of, you know, grist of part some of the, mill yeah, of, uh, yeah. of communal violence is very great. But I think it goes beyond this. Because going back to the, as it were, indigenous languages of partition, which I'm sure the museum in Amritsar will tell us more mm -hmm. about, it's not about um, you know, absolute irreconcilability and enmity. The thing about partition violence is that, as so many people on this panel, and Yasmin in particular, have examined, mm -hmm. 
is the intimacy of that violence. Yes. People know all about each other. Yeah. They are intimate with each other. They don't view the other as the other. Yeah. Uh, and even the way in which we describe and, uh, and name partition is about familiarity, whether it's taksimat in Urdu or batwara in Hindi. I mean, these are words that are normally, they're normal words. They're used to describe the apportionment often of a parental inheritance. You know, the father's house, the father dies, the property is divided between two, two brothers. So the, 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 in a way, the violence of partition is constantly and consistently seen in terms of brotherhood, fraternity, and that makes it even more violent in a way. There's nothing so violent as the fight between brothers. So this is not about strangers or even enemies in some conventional sense. Yeah. Thank you, thank you uh, for that. Um, uh, Yasmin Khan, if, if you can pick up the point about how the history is written, and can you also touch on the idea of people's history and the, the, the story, that, that being incorporated into a kind of larger story, mm -hmm. and particularly the vital importance which you have brought out with the, the centrality of World War II mm -hmm. in what then turns into partition uh, yeah. two yeah. years later? I I think that so much of the earlier writing about partition was so kind of concerned with these key big characters, Gandhi, Nehru, Dinner, and Mountbatten, and the constitutional discussions that it was very politically focused, but it forgot the social fabric and, and the social backdrop to what was happening. And at that time, you'd had 2.5 million soldiers serving in the armed forces in India, but the, the country, as a result of its involvement in the war, had been pitched into this economic and social transformation of epic proportions, yeah. and in particular the famine in Bengal in the 1943, the famine in which uh, three million people died. And I, I think India is not the same place in 1945 as it was in 1939. Sure. There's, there's been a, the Congress leaders have been in prison for that whole, that whole time. And so I think some of the literature now is starting to sort of put, join those dots, if you like, between the war and the partition, and to see the partition as, as, as a continuum, as part of a war, really, that it's a, it's a war by other means in some ways, or it's part of a global transformation that's been, that's been happening. And I think, I mean, to pick up on, on Fessel's point, um, there has been so much now learnt and understood since the 80s about the experience of people who, who, who went through that violence and the trauma and the, and the migration. But the, there is a gap still in a very sensitive and tricky space about how we can talk about those who, who acted as violent actors sure. who, who were doing the violence. Yeah. And that is still very, very tricky and silent. You know, there's a lot of silence around that. Mm. And I think that is um, partly because of the, this proximity and this closeness and the, this, the sense of being um, entangled with, with the other. But it's also, you know, some of these people were soldiers. Some of them were coming back from war. Some of them had been trained and drilled right. in um, militias. Uh, they were wearing uniforms and things like that. So this, the actual, uh, the, the seams between what is war and what is civilian violence are quite blurry, actually. But between, between, meaning what? So they would be people who'd been demobilized from World War II. Yeah. They would have the military training. They would yeah. know how to scout well, ahead, how to insert, how to... It's a classic vacuum of power. Right. <laughs> no, the, the, the Raj is, in, is really collapsing. It's really not... It has nothing like the strength it had earlier. It, by 46, the British are desperate to, to, to backtrack, to get out. And I think that in that, in that vacuum of power, other kinds of forms of authority grow up, and they, be they... Um, they're sort of pseudo police in a way, the like, uh, groups, and they're not dissimilar to some of the groups that we see in India and Pakistan today. today and you know, unfortunately. And, and worth mentioning, maybe that e even in the early stages of 1947, whether it was British officialdom or Indian nationalist leaders or the Muslim League, uh, there was not the assumption that in the event of partition there would be widespread displacement of the population yeah. or no. widespread no. massacres. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. find all yeah. of these yeah. figures saying statements that are hostages to fortune. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nehru famously saying, I think, in 1946, that when the British leave, there'll be peace in India and, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can, can, can I ask you, you all, really, uh, or, or the, those who want to, to comment on just the question of partition? Why is partition so central to uh, 20th century decolonization? Why uh, in Ireland or uh, in Palestine or in India does it seem at the time to be such a good solution? I mean, can partition in principle be a good idea, or does it depend on people being obliged to take a single uh, identity? Uh, Faisal, do you want to kick off on that? I mean, if you look at all the partitions you have um, mentioned, mm. 
uh, none of them has been particularly successful. Exactly, yeah. It's true the Republic of Ireland <coughs> is you know, a viable, stable country, yeah. but the mess of Northern Ireland yeah. remains. Yeah. Uh, if we talk about uh, the ex-Yugoslavia, you know, Kosovo, Bosnia, etc., if we talk about South Sudan, if we talk about East Timor, if we talk, there are many examples of partition mm. of which Ireland is probably the first, you know, proper one yeah. or imperial one. You can talk about Poland, of course, before that. Uh, they have resulted, for the most part, in quite disastrous uh, political, cultural, etc., <coughs> consequences. Uh, so the very ideology upon which partition is based, which is to say a clean break, mm -hmm. you know, we, what Jinnah used to say, we are brothers, and because we are brothers, we hate each other. So what we need to do is partition the parental house and become friends. How do you transit from being a brother to being a friend, which is what you wanted, and make a contract? So Jinnah thought partition was the most wonderful thing ever to happen before the violence really began. Because he conceived of it as, and he put it in so many words, as a social contract. This is the first time, in his view, that the social contract, which in Europe had only ever been a theory, with Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, etc., is fulfilled in India by civilian leaders and not by military means. He thought it was a grandiose achievement. And yet, of course, we know that it has held back both India and Pakistan for a period of 70 years and made the entire region prey to proxy wars yeah. um, since then. Who else is coming? Just, uh, just to pick up on that. Yeah. Sorry, I think my mic, yeah. Um, you know, the whole thing I think Jinnah had, the, the idea he had was that borders would be porous. Everybody would travel across, and you know, there would not be these distinctions. But that didn't obviously happen. And um, I just want to come to this other point that, <laughs> memories and you know how it was reflected in art and literature of the time. Yes, yes. Uh, in Punjab, um, I, we had Devanand once actually talking in London and somebody asked him that why didn't Bollywood films, and they were all affected by uh, partition, most of the Bollywood families came from <coughs> you know, partition backgrounds, and he said why were there no Bollywood films uh, on partition? And he said they just wanted to forget that. Uh, but in Bengal, we had a lot of cinema on partition. Ritri Ghatak was obsessed with partition. Mm -hmm. So his, his film, uh, it's called Komal Gandhar, talking about this yeah. porous border. It's a beautiful scene, which you know, just stays with me. It's this rail track that goes uh, and ends um, at the river bank. And these sand dunes are there. And on the other side of the river, the Padma River is uh, what is now, what was then East Pakistan and now Bangladesh. And uh, this couple, the hero and heroine, they stand there. And they said, at one time, the trains would come from Calcutta, get off here and these ferries would take people across. He says this was, uh, this train line was a plus, uh, adding, you know, he, he uses in Bengali, it was a plus sign for the two sides, the two sides of the river. It's now become a minus. And that's the whole thing, that the borders were not going to be porous. They were going to have this strong division. And the hero says, I can never go back. I just see the lights. So this angst of partition and this angst of division just uh, and I mean, and do you think that, that creatively there's been a, uh, a shift now in terms of how people turn partition into movies or novels or well, other forms of... Well, now it, it was only in the 1980s that uh, you had Garam Hawa, which was the first film on partition, and that came that late. Uh, now, of course, I think we've had quite a few on partition, mm. so it's changing. Uh, but Viceroy's uh, house? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Don't laugh. I haven't. Megna, it's your turn. No, no. Well, I think what is interesting, as Faisal said, you see, the top people had no idea that there was going to be people's movements. So they were lawyers, and they said nothing has really changed. Uh, so when people moved across, they were not called refugees because technically they had not lost a country they were called displaced persons. Mm. <laughs> you know, because again, the lawyers everywhere, they had to be quite sure that these people, the people who moved from what became Pakistan to what was India, had not lost their citizenship of Pakistan. They just were no longer, you know, likely to survive if they lived. So that, the, the distance between the top and the bottom was, the only person who said this was Ambedkar in a book written in 1940. He has seen the European experience after First World War, and he said, you set up nations and you will have mass human movements. Mm. Because suddenly you say, 
ये मेरा देश है दिस इज माई कंट्री नॉट योर कंट्री गेर आर and that was a very important thing and which people had not anticipated and there were a few questions i mean there a question was put to mount batten after the day after the partition plan was announced will there be a transfer of population will people move and he said well there might be some transfer of population but people weren't really <laughs> thinking about it and <laughs> and then no, in october uh, in october of of 1947 it becomes official policy to have an exchange of population across Punjab so before that mm. Mm. those movements had not actually been uh, legitimate so they had been there was so much confusion because some people were saying you should keep people where they are and mm. others were saying you should facilitate the movement and help okay. people get them into trucks get them on the trains and so on so mm. there's complete uh, the the actual implementation of the plan the the the, the mm. gap as you say between yes. the yeah. what's being decided in delhi and what happens yeah. on the ground i mean it's just uh, there's there's no sense of uh, how it's going to actually happen, work yeah. Yeah. i just want to make a larger point that i think the british empire was virtually unique in, in in the fact that they partitioned almost all the lands that they occupied as opposed to the portuguese the spanish the dutch the french and uh, you mentioned some of them there's rhodesia and i think the other problem was that the imperial british government did not understand the religion because they had no experience in this land of religious ethnic divides this was a sectarian conflict in this country they were all christians whether they were catholic or protestant and also uh, christianity was a religion of europe and uh, hinduism and islam were somehow inferior so there was this attitude they didn't understand it so what they didn't understand they just divided and separated and i think it started quite soon after the mutiny of 1957 with very tragic consequences and indians have always played into the hands of you know any power that's come from outside and been ready to be divided and ruled and uh, if i might make one more point in 1942 when the crips mission went to india and he proposed Uh, dominion status for india which would have come after the war and sri aurobindo who great nationalist yogi and erstwhile freedom fighter sent a message to nehru and the all the leaders of the congress please accept this he said because i can see that the uh, the british power is going to wane they are not going to be able to hold on to india and they will just simply sail away and it's the only opportunity for india to emerge intact as one country which has always been and they of course scoffed at him and said what does he know he's been in seclusion for 40 years and he <laughs> said that you know it's the destiny of india is going to be realized only as one whole country and he said that was the last opportunity that india had to emerge at, intact and after that the divisions became inevitable and i mean of course against that kind of foresight you did have people uh, for example <laughs> princely rulers even in Uh, the summer of 1947 saying that the british were not really going to go and that they were saying they were going to go but obviously <laughs> british rule was going to continue so i mean the 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 uh, among elite thinkers the idea of what the future was going to be there was there was really no consensus can i can i move on to something that sort of really very much connects to partition which is the conflict between india and pakistan that's continued largely over kashmir but also m- more generally in the last 70 years um I think it's it's striking if you go to some other parts of the world where there are very long run histor- long running historical conflicts or ongoing historical conflicts that 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 you you could almost argue that the 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 the, the kind of break between India and Pakistan is more easily open to a solution it's sort of more soluble than perhaps the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians why do you think it is that and and I'm not talking really about the present regimes in Uh, in India or Pakistan but what why is it that th- there has never been a, a kind of acceleration forward into a larger idea of South Asia where for example the line of actual control just becomes the accepted international border who wants to take on that <laughs> one? I, I, you know i i you know i think you you have to you have to look at the psychology of the smaller country in a smaller country i e pakistan fears they will be swallowed up swallowed up meaning swallowed up in in, in the larger south asian union mm-hmm. what is pakistan i've i've talked to people in pakistan they will be swallowed and one thing that jinnah wanted to do was to have a kind of minority rights protection of the muslims who are minority mm-hmm. whether you are right or not is another issue and they feel that we get it back in there and we'll be swallowed 
because you know until until a democratic solution was envisaged while the british were there there was no democracy so numbers did not count as soon as dominion status is proposed as soon as democracy is threatened numbers count one person one vote and that is when minority status becomes important and you know in sorry there is one more thing in the northern ireland good friday agreement mm -hmm. we made amazing uh, innovation that in northern ireland both communities had to separately agree <laughs> by majority to the agreement protestants had to vote and catholics had to vote and only when both con communities separately had voted for the agreement was the agreement had they said majority was the catholics would say we are not playing because we are in a minority those guys will rule over us and that logic you know consociationalism mm -hmm. as faisal would know we just did not know about that time and so i think even now it's very difficult to uh, to propose a uh, union Be uh, and i know a lot of people who are, who are, who are fighting for it mm. because uh, pakistan is feel my god these guys will you know eat us up so can i ask the historians do you do you think that the the lack of a solution is rooted in the history or in the the kind of functionality of present day government i mean if i may you know what you what you were saying mm. earlier about um, the possibilities of uh, if you will reconciliation of course had its most significant political um, manifestation in the so called musharraf plan right. mm. uh, before he was just before he was yeah. ousted from power which was precisely about making that line of control if you will a fungible or open border yeah. and uh, doing it initially through sort of free trade type moves uh, which would then expand outwards mm -hmm. it really was uh, the most creative plan mm -hmm. uh, whether mr musharraf thought of it himself or not is another question right. but a very creative plan and was i think seriously entertained by the indian side as well but it was not to be yet it tells us that you know with the requisite uh, a sense of ambition a risk and adventure mm. uh, such a thing might be possible the problem now of course is that uh, things have become uh, so much especially with social media uh, popular opinion plays such a huge sure. role uh, sure. that old fashioned diplomacy no no longer really works in the yeah. way it, it had once done <coughs> and i would i would say also that in some ways it's not indians and pakistanis they can actually arrive at an agreement it's the fact that in particular there's a muslim minority of sizable proportions in india mm. whose loyalty is suspect and in a way uh, uh, you know if ambedkar had been proved right entirely mm. and there was a complete transfer population mm, yeah. then you could imagine there would have been a jinnah's friendship could have been possible be, yeah. but not in these circumstances yeah. yasmin well I, i agree very much with what faisal said and i think when you look at the history I mean, Kashmir has just been this flashpoint. That's where the wars have have focused upon. That's mm. where that has been. You know, it's this chicken and egg thing. People say if Kashmir was solved, would the wider problem be solved, or does the wider problem have to be solved for Kashmir to be solved? But that has been the place where the wars have 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 kept returning to. Um, and they ha I suppose it's not about the people in so much as um, when South Asians get together, as they do in in. London <laughs> no there's no there's no problem and as they do when they are able to meet but increasingly over time it's become harder for people to cross the border and it's yeah. harder and harder for people to to meet and see each other and that's right. when the stereotypes the 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 inflated kind of um perceptions of the other creep in because there's no real kind of context for being able to meet and go and watch and and, and maybe maybe together. worth mentioning also that i mean one one of the striking things is in in other parts of india in south india or even central india there's a sort of indifference to mm. partition oh, okay. an indifference to pakistan yeah. of a kind yeah. that you don't yeah. find in for example conversations in london where as you say there are people from different bits of south asia who love talking about this yeah. stuff yeah. um can i just before we open to the audience can ask I everybody yeah. briefly but and by all means make 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 other other points as you go how how should partition now uh, be remembered do, do you want to yeah I, i was sort yeah. of this is the last point i think it's important to think of a resolution because you know 50 years 60 years 70 years we get together at anniversaries mm -hmm. and talk about it i think there is only one thing that comes to my mind which sort of is a unifying 
taste is that's Bollywood. Even in the kind of, uh, it's a serious point because I think even the Taliban have been watching Bollywood and the raids in there. So, I mean, if we can find some kind of an entry point through Bollywood to reach across and carry the message. That or, or I guess the Taliban have been checking which bits of Bollywood people should not watch. Which <laughs> I think they're just enjoying the song and dance routines. No, one thing I wanted to say <laughs> that the museum uh, in Amritsar starts with syncretic Punjab as an introduction to it, i.e. there was once upon a time a single Punjab. And then partition takes place at independence, but there is the same language, it's the same sort of musical tradition, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of evidence that there are, there are Muslim families learning Bharat Natyam and things like that, which we have found. So but what we, have to, we have to remember that just as in Bengal, there was once a single Punjab. And when you cross from, from you know, Atari to Waga, nothing changes. I tell you, the most shocking part is nothing changes if you go by car. It's the same country. No, of course. Uh, it, sorry. <laughs> it, it is the same. You know, it yeah. wouldn't change. And um, I do think that we have to put the responsibility down. People to people, everybody <laughs> wants to go to. I know people in Karachi and Lahore, they just want to come to India. They want to shop. They want to buy Kolaburi chapels. They want to, they want to go see the Taj. It's simple things like this. People to people, they're all there. I think it's the politicians, it's the governments that are. I mean, the very fact that Kashmir has been going downhill from 2014, it was creeping up. You know, things were happening, and then it's just uh, going downhill. I, I think um, school textbooks are absolutely crucial in this, and I think um, it's some kind of form of, of shared history and understanding and an acceptance that both countries are real. They exist, they've been there for 70 years, mm -hmm. and they've taken somewhat different trajectories, but there's a lot of shared ground. And I think people, some kind of common um, understanding of the history is really what has to come about. I think that's what I'd like to see. I think we're still trapped in this uh, colonial vision, uh, yeah. uh, which uh, poses religion as this kind of ir irrational thing against the highly rational politics of the lawyers whom Meghnath was talking about. But I think partition demonstrates just the opposite. It's not the victory of religion over rational politics. In fact, religion is what fails. Had it been religious loyalties, which is what Jinnah and others depended upon, they would have held together. But in fact, Muslims are willing to sacrifice their co-religionists in India, and Hindus are willing to sacrifice theirs in Pakistan. So the thing is, it was uh, it was the most uh, uh, gruesome and egregious betrayal of religious loyalties, which are meant to hold the country together in this awful way through as hostages, you know, the so-called hostage theory. That is what failed. And once we come to terms with that, we realize that religion is not the kind of thing we have made it out to be. It has, it's bad enough as it stands. Uh, but the cause of partition is actually the betrayal of religious loyalty and not its, um, uh, its enforcement. Thank you. So we've, we've just got time for a few questions. Um, one here, one here. If we can ask them successively, and then the panel can, uh, yeah, if you'd like to go first, please. I'd like to thank all of you for your very interesting um, obser observations about partition, about which I read a lot. And I'd like particularly to commend uh, Yasmin Khan's book to anybody who hasn't read it. It's a Absolutely. really fantastic book. Uh, I also thought uh, Dr. Davies' observation that partition is often got with bloodshed very interesting because I was going to ask you, could the awful bloodshed have been avoided? Um, I'm actually partly from Northern Ireland and I think the experience there shows that maybe it can't be. Uh, Kashmir, I have to say, is a very, very depressing uh, place. I've been there very recently several times and it gives the impression of being an occupied country. If we were in Kashmir now, there would be young soldiers with guns all around us. And it reminded me, when I went there last, of being in Belfast at the height of the Troubles. So uh, Kashmir has, sadly, although it is one, one of the most beautiful... One of the most... What is your question? Thank you. My Thank question you. is, is there any resolution in Kashmir? Thank you. And we'll, we'll, we'll take one or two more questions and we'll sort of add them together, please. Goes on yeah. and on, you know, Thank you. Hi, um, I'm 32 years old, and I'm the daughter, the granddaughter of a Sikh man who 
travelled down from, um, he was in Lahore and he travelled down to uh, Jalandhar uh, about six months before partition happened. So he was aware that something was happening. I only found that out two years ago. Um, I was brought up and born in the UK. And the only stuff I read about partition was from the BBC World Service or like information that came from British journalism. And I'm actually a little bit uncomfortable with the British government sponsoring uh, 70 years since India's independence without a kind of understanding of the role that they played in partition. They don't commemorate partition and they don't want to talk about it. And I struggle quite a lot trying to find and access information that comes from British Asian writers or actually learning about the um, museum. So like, how can people of my generation who have no understanding of what happened and don't recognize the role that Britain played actually access that information and what role does the British government or British journalists play in exposing that information Thank to? You. Uh, and we've got one more, one more question here. Hello. I'm from Bangla Bangladesh. Now, what impact uh, the independence of Bangladesh has created in relationship between India and Pakistan? Is it good or bad? And what's likely to happen in the future? OK, so if the panelists would like, like to answer some or all of the questions, one, thanking the speakers for their contributions, uh, mentioning Kashmir, the Northern Irish image of the, the soldiers around uh, the tent, hypothetically. Uh, the question of the... I, I didn't know the British government were celebrating 70, 70 <laughs> years of independence. They're investing a lot of money in... in That's what... In the oh, OK, so maybe somebody can, can touch on that. And then also the question um, on, on Bangladesh. Who would like to... Can I... Oh, sorry, can I comment yeah. on the Bangladesh? Yeah. Um, you know, it's really interesting you say that because uh, there's a historian in India, Ritu Menon, who went around uh, doing a lot of interviews about partition. And what she found when she was interviewing uh, those in uh, the Bangladesh, present day Bangladesh, was that for them, this partition and the independence didn't matter anymore. For them, it is the second, you know, their independence, 1971 is there. So partition, it's happened, it's gone, but it wasn't the overriding, uh, you know, factor in their lives at all. It is 1971, so their history has moved on. Uh, whereas. I come from a family which is also my family was originally from Bangladesh. So my father, you know, their lives began in this train, train st railway station. They lost everything. It's, it's the usual refugee story. And, uh, but my father and, you know, my uncles just spoke all the time about partition. You know, we grew up just hearing them talk about how much they missed and how they couldn't go back. So the realities in both these countries have also changed. And um, I don't know if that answers your question a little bit. <laughs> in, well, no, I'm, that was. No, I, was, I was for a long time arguing for a, a independent autonomous Kashmir. I, I went around in Pakistan and India. And uh, nobody wanted that. Absolutely nobody wanted an independent, self-governing Kashmir with both parts together. Uh, I said, you know, we have a Switzerland model, we have, a, you know, also models, and there can be condominium arrangements, security guaranteed. And I, I went to Pakistan several times, I've talked to Nobody was an independent Kashmir. They either want it for themselves, as long as the other person doesn't have, nobody minds Kashmir being divided. <laughs> See, that is a problem. Because each side has Kashmir as a little token of their you know, their virtue, India, that this is a secular country and Kashmir is our badge of secularism. And for Pakistan, Kashmir is theirs because it is a Muslim country. Thank you. Uh, Yasmin. Hang on, we'll, we'll add more questions in a second. Yes, just let Yasmin answer. I was going to um, change tack and answer the question about the yes. Indo-British um, Indo year of culture, which is going yeah. on at the moment, unbeknown to us all. But uh, I think that's very, I mean, you know, that's about economic relationships, and I think they will steer clear very carefully of anything that's in, in, at least a bit sensitive. But there is a lot of attention this year to, to partition anniversary, and the BBC will do a season this summer all around August 15th, and there's a lot of interested interesting filmmakers and quite creative work, I think, come, which will be shown in August, and uh, also radio documentaries, um, work on the culture and music film related to partition. So, but there used to be, um, on the national curriculum, the possibility of doing partition history in some schools. 
and there, ha there have been a few schools that have been teaching it. But as I understand it, somebody might be able to correct me, yeah. but it's, it's been rolled back right. as part of the GO reform. So, so, so let, let, let's have some, some more questions. I mean, another point to make about this is that what it really reflects is the larger question of the way that imperial history is taught or not taught in British schools. I mean, as you say, it's a, it's a complete uh, absence. And I, I know Shashi Theroux has made this point to several TV interviewers, that, that, that there is a sort of manifest ignorance uh, within British culture of what imperial history means. But maybe, maybe it's also, also worth saying that, you know, t 20 years ago when I was interviewing people for liberty or death in India and in Pakistan, it was a similar story that people who'd been through partition said, nobody wants to know, nobody yeah. wants to remember, exactly. I wouldn't speak about this with my family because nobody would be interested. And I think that is now very much in the process of changing. We've got one question here and one here. Please, yeah. I think um, you made the point about um, how it's been neglected, partition in the BBC, the Guardian, like the British kind of media. But often you do hear about the kind of Punjabi side of partition. But the Bengali side, I'm of Bengali origin, has been completely neglected. And I'm just more to Shrabani. The fact that Bengal, as we know, is a kind of very literary center. We're at literary festival talking about liter literature going into history. How come Bengalis ourselves, we've neglected to get that word of partition, what happened in Bengal across the world, because we don't hear about it at all. Even quite academic British people will know, quite intelligent British people, intellectual British people know about the partition of Punjab, but they don't know anything what happened in Bengal. I'd well, just like to, if you could address that issue. I know you touched on it slightly. Do you want to pass the, the mic to the, this woman just behind you, yeah. Hi, wonderful panel. I'm Bhavna Rajpal, the director of the Sindhi Film Festival, and my PhD is on Sindhi cinema. I question is for Desai Saab in um, specific, particularly, and a general question for the panel. In terms of the Sindhi side of the partition, what do you think has been done in terms of the works that have come out? And for Desai Saab, the first film, Sindhi film, that was made post-partition was Abana. It was head-on, on partition, facing it, not unlike Bollywood, which wanted to forget partition. What is the um, role of the museum for the Sindhi community, and I have my grandparents here who have migrated from um, which part? Sakhar. Sorry, I forgot. Um, so, in terms of the artifacts and all, what can we do, and whether we can collaborate? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, so, we we we, we had a, an earlier question from the audience, wanting to bring in Kashmir. We now need to bring in Bengal and bring in Sindh. Um, okay, let's go. You you've each got two minutes, and then we'll, then we'll have to wrap up. Oh. Faisal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also want to address a couple of the earlier questions and maybe take in the Sindh one as well, uh, which is that Bangladesh is actually a very interesting case because you know, it is the independence of Bangladesh in 1971 that really introduces the language of genocide and Holocaust, et cetera, into South Asia. Because it is, it, mm. that is what happened. It's also in the 1970s when this is happening uh, all over the world. Now, very curiously, this didn't manage to uh, 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 translate itself into India and Pakistan in any significant way, apart from in the 80s and 90s in some of the academic work. Mm. Uh, and I wonder whether the relative silence on partition in India and Pakistan is actually more beneficial. I'm talking, addressing the issues of silence here. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a trauma that might be there in silence, but also there is a kind of delicacy. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of refusal to let this horrific event become part of a nationalist, ideological, uh, uh, you know, kind of wind up, which is what you see happening in Bangladesh today, where it plays into authoritarianism. It didn't, but it does insofar as it becomes nationalist ideology. And that is what we have relatively been saved from in both India and Pakistan, so that people are actually unwilling or unable to identify in status terms. You know, Vina Das has done this work where you, you interview uh, survivors of partition, and often they can't even name it. Partly, as I said, it's traumatic, but partly because it's unthinkable in the script of the nation state. It's only thinkable in terms of families, betrayals within families, travels from one place to another. And that actually preserves the, the concrete realities of the situation, uh, rather than just making them grist for the so mill of is, national So this is like the ideology. argument that, that things like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission many years later can in fact make things worse because it stirs up and becomes an excuse for further conflict. It might, but say Meghnad and Kishore's museum 
is obviously not part of a kind, it's not plugged into it's nationalist in ideology. So yeah. actually you can think about those very particular moments, the briefcase, etc., you know, which mm -hmm. don't necessarily fit into. It's the particularities that get lost yeah. when people just start identifying as Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, or Indians, or Pakistanis. Right. And, the, and Bangladesh is actually the kind of interesting, understandable but negative example right. of what this kind of memory can do. You know, just uh, an argument that I've heard many times is that when India was partitioned and one half became an Islamic state, why was the other half a secular state? Why was it not a Hindu state? And this is the argument of the organized Hindu religion, the Khadas and the Peets and Swami Karpratri and Alan Danilo. What's my observation? I'm not a you know political philosopher, but there's been very cheap politicking for votes, some appeasement of the minorities. I belong to a minority community, which is 2% of the population. I think that sort of twisted their political agenda in many times. And this appeasement has taken you know, created little reservoirs and reservations and all, which has not helped India at all. So the question is, food for thought, if it, India, if Hinduism is the state religion of India, like in Britain, with the right to practice anything you want, would that make the dialogue with Pakistan any easier? Um, I mean, I, I, think, um, I, I think there's, there's still, I mean, a, a lot to be said about Pakistan and many people you know, need to have those conversations at a family level. At, at a, they they need to kind of still talk and have those conversations. And as you say, it's the detail, it's the this the, the family connection which is so important. But when we take that out and actually look at it on a wider scale, on a broader canvas, it it starts to distort and starts to change. And it's very hard to keep those specificities. And one way of doing that is to think about the regionalism of partition. And there were 600 refugee camps across South Asia, you know, big ones, <laughs> after 47. There were some in Madras. There were, there were refugees you know, all over Pakistan, all over India, actually, as well as in, in Punjab and Bengal. There's studies coming out of regional studies of Kashmir, of Sindh, um, even of Ladakh. You know, so actually, you know, going back to places and really thinking about the specifics of what happens in a local area, what happens in one town, why does one town have riots and another not? Right. No, and that, those kinds of questions, that's the sort of work that historians are doing now to try and really unpick um, the specificity of the violence rather, to, rather than to think of it as something sweeping mm. through the whole subcontinent but without any variation. No. Thank you. Right. Oh, I'll be really brief because, as you say, I've, you know, I have touched on this, but there is a lot of literature in Bengali literature on the partition. You know, enough. Um, in the 60s, there was uh, Shunil Ganguly, and the films were made endlessly, endlessly on the partition. So we have that. I guess uh, Amitabh Ghosh for the new, uh, you know, modern writers, he's touched on partition. Uh, we probably need more translations of the old books. I don't know, but um, that's the literature. <laughs> Well, yeah, yes, but of I, course. Let, yeah. me, let me say just briefly, the violence in the Punjab was several times higher than the violence on the Bengal, on the Bengal side. side. Because Bengal side, there was not this big exodus across. There was Gandhi you know, as well. Most, most of the 18 million or whatever it is crossed over, crossed over on the Punjab border. Now, coming to the Sindh uh, problem, Yes, we are collecting a lot of material in Sin, and if there are oral histories, we will send people to record oral histories, and I would love to get in touch with you about the Sindhi Film Society, because we have been gathering quite a lot of material on Sin. And interesting thing is, again, on the Sin side, the violence was much less, because most people either sailed down to, to Gujarat or Bombay, or took a train across to Rajasthan. There was a train and from Hyderabad across. And so what you really have... I know. I don't know. I, know. I mean, I mean, just took physical violence, okay? I mean, there's the emotional violence. In the Ulhas Nagar in Mumbai, it's still a Sindhi slum. Uh, you know, I mean, after, what, 70 years. I, as a Gujarati, I only, as a Gujarati, I only know partition because of Sindhis. Sindhis came to Baroda and we said they were dirty, they, they, were, they were immoral, all the prejudices against immigrants that people, people have known. We had them without meeting a single Sindhi uh, at, at, the, at that time. So, it, so but Sindhis uh, worked very hard, absorbed themselves, became a part of it. They have lost a the language. 
because Sindhi is not a recognized Indian language. And, uh, and so, maybe it is now, but once upon a time it was. Okay, so, so I, th you know, I think we are going to uh, have Sindhi uh, uh, records, and please get in touch with us and we will do that. No problem. Well, thanks very much all for coming. Thank you for this. Um, and, and, thank you, and thank you very much to the panelists, the diverse group of panelists for this uh, act of remembering a partition. Thank you.